with species like mm-hmm. takahe and kiwi and saddleback and kiwi. Right. Pretty and, cool. Yeah, and, and she doesn't remind people too of the, of the botanical biodiversity. There are about 15 native orchids on the island. Wow. Are there? Yes. <laughs> are, you a, are, are you an orchid watcher, Gary? Did, uh, no. Hmm. No, you, no. you sounded incredulous then, as if Elizabeth was making that up. Who, me? As if she would be. No, <laughs> no, no I, I, oh. I have a fascination with orchid watchers and orchid watching and why there is a fascination with them. <laughs> mm. Are they related to train watchers or is that...? Yes, maybe. <laughs> hey, uh, look, um, thank you very much for your time, uh, uh, Elizabeth, and appreciate it. And just by the way, so you can go there, you just look online and you can actually book a trip there. You absolutely can, and it's worth a visit. Lovely. Thank you very much for that. Uh, that is Elizabeth Andrew from the Rangitoto Island Historic Conservation Trust, their former chair. And that's our Friday. And a big thank you to both Paula Penfold and Gary Moore. I really appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Than me, Wallace. Uh, great. I'm back Monday, 3.45. Big thanks to Amelia Lang for putting, putting the week together. See you later. This is Checkpoint on RNZ National. I'm Lisa Owen. Our Heidi Akine. Deflated expectations for some after a vague announcement around a Cook Islands travel bubble. We talked to the Cook Islands Prime Minister. The handbrake's gone on exercise excursions for MIQ guests for now after a bungled bus trip with a COVID positive passenger. BMW makes a quick getaway from UFC star Israel Adesanya over his rape comments. Doctors warn over run emergency departments are just a symptom of more serious ills. Some property investors scrape in before the new Brightline tax rules. We're on a dawn mission into the forest to check out the rise of the kōkako. And we head to the UK where a proposed no jab, no pint policy falls a little flat. RNZ News at five o'clock. Good afternoon, I'm Marama Tipoli. MIQ's compassionate exemption process won't be expanded despite the COVID-19 response minister saying they're trying to be as compassionate as possible. This comes as a video of a crying woman seen behind the gates of a managed isolation facility while reaching out to her late mother's hearse went viral. Chris Hipkins says he acknowledges that the virus has been hugely disruptive. Look, the compassionate exemption process is uh, deliberately very narrow because we want to make sure that we're getting those uh, who really desperately need that extra space. Uh, The wider we make it, the more likely it is that someone who really desperately needs one is going to miss out. The head of Managed Isolation and Quarantine, Brigadier Jim Bliss, says he didn't know about the funeral procession in advance. He says if there are further cases, they may may need to make plans on how to manage them. The Cook Islands Prime Minister is confident quarantine-free travel with New Zealand will start in May. His bilateral meeting today with Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern included discussion of the Cook's vaccination campaign and 20 million New Zealand dollars in additional support. Mark Brown says the tourism-reliant country is ready for a two-way travel bubble. We have asked for a date uh, for the commencement of that. We are working towards that date. Uh, And I'm happy that uh, the month of May is where we're indicating uh, that travel will begin between our two countries. Mark Brown is the first international leader to meet Jacinda Ardern since the border closed a year ago. A faith-based abuse survivor group says a formal public apology by the Catholic Church to those abused while in its care is a stunt. Cardinal John Dew made the apology at the Royal Commission into Abuse and Care in Auckland. The director of the Survivors Network of those abused by priests, Christopher Longhurst, says an apology is not acceptable when it is not accompanied by personal apologies to each victim. The apology is coming at the end of phase two of the redress. Therefore, that's given the impression to many of our members um, that this is a public public relations uh, stunt. Dr Longhurst says survivors want a personal apology so the healing can begin. A former child, youth and family carer has been found guilty of sexually violating and indecently assaulting young boys in his care. 
Earl William Obetaya ran an Auckland SIFS home in the early to mid-2000s, caring for around 150 boys over five years. He faced 26 charges, including sexual violation, threatening to kill and supply of cannabis. Today in the High Court at Auckland, a unanimous jury found him guilty of 21 charges and not guilty of five charges. Some property investors have reconsidered buying or selling houses after the government's announcements on Tuesday. Any property sale finalised today will not be caught by the new requirement that a house must now be owned for 10 years or more to avoid a tax on capital gain. Property lawyer Michael Hoffman Body says he's had inquiries around bringing settlements forward. BMW has dumped UFC fighter Israel Adesanya as a brand ambassador following a controversial social media post about rape. Kamina Blewett has more. Adesanya says he now understands the gravity of his words after sending a tweet saying he would rape opponent Kevin Holland. The 2019 Halberg Sportsman of the Year insists it was just fight talk, but the comment was immediately condemned by a rape prevention group and the Deputy Prime Minister, Grant Robertson. The original post has been deleted. BMW has reviewed the comments and decided against making him a brand ambassador. Adesanya says he will in future choose his words more wisely. Kwa Kamina Bluet, TNA. It's four minutes past five. New Zealand are on course for a series clean sweep over Bangladesh in the one-day cricket series. Needing 319 to win Bangladesh a short time ago was struggling at 60 for four after 20 overs at the Mason Reserve in Wellington. The Black Caps 318 for six was set up by a 159 run fifth wicket stand between Devon Conway and Daryl Mitchell. Conway scored his maiden international century, making 126. Mitchell scored his first international one-day ton, scampering through for two runs on the final ball. I was just trying to swing as hard as I could, and there's a few player misses there, but um, a fair bit going on in the mind there, that's for sure. Um, yeah, especially it was nice for Mitch to chip that three there, the second last ball, and, and get me on strike, but yeah, it's nice to get it. The Hurricanes are hoping the appearance of All Blacks hooker Dane Coles will end their losing start to the Super Rugby Aotearoa when they play the Highlanders in Dunedin tonight. It'll be Coles' first game of the season, having missed the Hurricanes' three losses. Coach Jason Holland believes Coles' presence will lift the team in all facets of play. Lydia Ko has had a less than memorable opening round at the LPGA golf event in San Diego. She's eight shots off the lead after a two-over par first round. And that's the news. Tomorrow morning, author George Saunders explains the genius of the Russian short story writers. Astrophysicist Stephen Curran takes issue with Avi Loeb's extraterrestrial theory. Kaylin Robertson on quitting the alt-right movement. And Dr. Michael Baker on things other than COVID. And Kim Hill join me tomorrow morning from 8 on RNZ National. And now time for the Met Service forecast of midnight Saturday. Northland and Coromandel Peninsula, a few showers. Auckland to Wellington, including Bay of Plenty and the central high country, mainly fine. However, isolated showers developing about and north of Taihape. Gisborne to Wairarapa, fine, apart from areas of morning cloud or fog. Marlborough, Nelson, Buller and northern Westland, fine, apart from areas of cloud, a few showers developing tomorrow. South Westland and Fiordland, a few showers turning to rain tomorrow with some heavy falls from afternoon. Canterbury and Otago mainly fine with high cloud. Patchy light rain developing south of Ashburton tomorrow. And for Southland, cloudy with light rain at times, clearing later tomorrow. Chatham Islands, cloudy periods. Thanks, Marama. Welcome to Checkpoint. I'm Lisa Owen. Don't dust off your passport just yet. A much mooted travel bubble with the Cook Islands won't be on the cards until at least May. Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern and Cook Islands Prime Minister Mark Brown met today. He walked away with $20 million in additional funding, but no firm date for the bubble. And he joins me now. Good evening, Prime Minister. Uh, tēnā koe, Lisa. Kia ora and kia ora ana. What did you hope to get out of this trip in terms of the travel bubble? Uh, well, we came here with a purpose, uh, basically, to look at firming up the date for our two-way quarantine-free travel. Uh, it's a requirement now for our economy to be able to survive into the next year. Um, and so far, we're quite happy with the progress. We've uh, made a commitment, a joint commitment with New Zealand, that we will be looking at May, commencing the two-way travel. 
uh, and also discussions on the rollout of the vaccine, which uh, similarly went along very well. Uh, and again, looking at uh, a May date for the rollout. OK, so Prime Minister, when it was said at the press conference working towards May, do you take that to mean flights taking off from May? Yes, indeed. Uh, we expect to be in operation in May. Uh, as I made clear uh, in my discussions uh, with officials and with the Prime Minister, uh, we are ready now. Um, there are a few little uh, details that we do need to iron out, uh, but as a country, our health preparedness is at a state where we are uh, ready to be open for business. And I know our tourism sector in particular are ready and open for business. And I think the May timeline gives everybody a bit of, a bit of time uh, to gear up uh, for accommodators, for airlines, uh, and for customers who may want to look at a holiday in the Cook Islands. So you said you're ready now. You made that clear at the press conference as well. So what is it specifically that our Prime Minister wants when she still says there are some things to be agreed? There are some uh, minor details around documentation, uh, the processes that we have to have in place in the event of an incursion of COVID, um, our response plan, which we have in practice been, uh, been acting on over the last three months. We have had two-way quarantine-free travel, although restricted only to Cook Islanders and work permit holders. Uh, in response to the February outbreak, we acted appropriately, suspended passenger travel, uh, saw assurance that there was no community transmission, and then we resumed again. And I expect it's these sorts of things that we will need to uh, document uh, and put down properly, uh, because that's the, the way that business will be expected to operate at least for the next year. So is the expectation if there was an outbreak and borders had to be closed, people would be required to stay sheltering in the Cook Islands and they would be cared for for there if they needed medical treatment? Well, the outbreak, any outbreak would, would occur in New Zealand first, and that's where we would shut down passenger travel. Um, and that's been the case for the last year, and in particular the last three months. Um, and that's what we're now finalising is the details around our appropriate responses in the event of an outbreak in New Zealand. How confident are you that this is actually going to get off the ground in May? Because there's been several months that have been named as the month and it just seems to keep rolling out on. So what is your level of confidence that this will actually happen in May? I'm very confident that this will occur in May. Uh, and uh, we still have a week here in New Zealand in discussions with other agencies, with other ministers. Uh, there are a number of people that uh, do need to be assured that the Cook Islands is ready uh, and we'll be spending that time over the next few days with them uh, to provide that assurance. But I'm, I'm very confident. But Prime Minister, aren't they taking your word on it? Because you've stated very clearly you think you're ready. But obviously mm -hmm. someone thinks you're not. Yes, we think we're ready. Um, certainly there are some people that think maybe we do need to have uh, a few more of our T's crossed and a few more of our I's dotted. Uh, but... I'm very confident in the advice that I've been provided, uh, both here with our medical officials in, in the Cook Islands and also uh, New Zealand medical officials. How do you think you're being treated by New Zealand? Uh, um, is New Zealand being overly protective of the Cooks? I can certainly understand New Zealand sentiments, um, uh, particularly in light of uh, recent events such as the, the Samoa measles epidemic, uh, and really wanting to be sure uh, that New Zealand is not responsible for exporting COVID to our country or to any other country. Uh, but uh, we're, we're, uh, we're very grateful for New Zealand in the measures that they have undertaken, which have meant added protection to our country as well. Uh, but it's time now to get back to business. So obviously there have been reports of hundreds of people leaving to find jobs in New Zealand. Some of those people may not come back to the Cooks. What can you do in the meantime if the bubble's not going to get off the ground until May? What can you do to stem that flow? Well, this is a serious concern for us and one of the pressing matters why we need to get back up in business. The only way we can arrest the flow of people uh, leaving to look for work and look for income in New Zealand is to get back into business in our country. And do you think the promise of May is enough to stop them leaving right now? It will go some way towards stopping that, definitely. Uh, and that's why we are committed to uh, an opening in May. I just wanted to also talk about travel to, towards you of medical professionals, right? So New Zealand doctors come to the Cooks to deliver care operations and, and other things, other services. So with movements restricted, what effect is that having on the Cook Islands? 
Well, we did have this problem, particularly last year, uh, but with the two-way bubble opening up for Cook Islanders and work permit holders, including uh, doctors, members of the judiciary, we have now commenced that travel. That is already occurring now, although at a, to a restricted um, population. Um, but it certainly uh, helped out uh, now that we have got it going, uh, since January, in fact. And this is, the, I guess, one of the bases for our argument why we're ready for an opening in, in May. We have, in effect, been operating two-way quarantine and have been able to respond to any outbreaks in New Zealand, such as the Valentine's Day one, appropriately to ensure that the COVID doesn't even get into the country. So we're confident in the measures we have. Uh, we'd now like to extend uh, that two-way bubble to the wider New Zealand holidaying public. So how important will the July school holidays be to you? I think, uh, <laughs> well, the holidays are important, uh, but for us, any sort of uh, commencement of visitor arrivals are going to make a, a great deal of difference. The numbers required from our perspective are not large, uh, but they certainly do make a huge difference in terms of uh, visitors coming through. Uh, we're talking, um, you know, two or three flights a week that are full. That could be up to six or 700 people uh, a week coming in. Now, in the context of New Zealand's domestic tourism, it's just a fraction. Uh, but they make a big difference to us. Well, you said that um, you need this before the end of the year to underpin your economy. So are you telling us that if you don't get a bubble, a travel bubble with New Zealand, <coughs> by the end of the year, that your economy could fall apart? We have the private sector who have invested millions of dollars um, in their product. If there is no income coming into these businesses, they stand the very real risk of losing their properties, losing their investments. Now, that's a far greater um, issue than just a, a balance sheet problem. This is a far greater structural issue with the economy uh, that we need to address. And the first step is getting back into business. On the subject of vaccines, the New Zealand Prime Minister says there needs to be some contracts so sorted out with the medical companies that are supplying um, the drugs. Will you need to get New Zealand MedSafe approvals before you can use those uh, vaccines in the Cook Islands? Well, we entered the COVAX uh, agreement for the supply of vaccines uh, as part of New Zealand's uh, supply for, for the vaccine. So our avenue for vaccinations is through New Zealand. Uh, the issues around the indemnities we have agreed to already. Um, we are, in fact, ready to roll out the vaccinations as soon as our vaccines are available to us. And, and are you happy to take any of the ones offered or are you holding out for a particular one? We've indicated our preference for the Pfizer vaccine, which is what New Zealand has. Um, and for ourselves, we'd be able to vaccinate the entire eligible population uh, within two weeks. So we've got pre-orders with Janssen, AstraZeneca and Novavax. You don't want any of those? Um, not right now because the, the, the first available uh, vaccine off the cab is uh, Pfizer. And for us, uh, vaccination, if it comes earlier rather than later, is just added assurance and added protection to our people. So it's just an issue of immediacy. You want it as soon as you can get it? As soon as we can get it, we are ready to roll it out. And as I said, we could vaccinate our... Uh, our population with its first jabs by uh, within two weeks. Appreciate your time this evening. That is the Cook Islands Prime Minister, uh, Mark Brown, joining us there this evening, talking on the bubble, well, working towards May for a travel bubble with the Cooks. Doctors are warning the massive pressures facing hospitals across the country are likely to get worse before they get better. At least two emergency de departments this week reached capacity, but health staff say that's a symptom of a much greater strain on the whole system. The health minister met with concerned medical staff today, and while they say he is listening, the fix isn't going to happen anytime soon. Nita Blake-Person reports. It was during a 16-hour wait for her elderly father to get treatment at Waikato Hospital this Bay of Plenty woman realised how bad things had gotten for the health system. They sat in triage for hours for what turned out to be a brain bleed. Her dad was one of the lucky ones. At least he had a bed. The one staff member on was doing their best to try to find space. The whānau room was full of patients. The corridors were full. It was 
absolutely phenomenal. This was in January. It wasn't like it was the middle of winter. She doesn't want to be identified, but says it was an eye-opening experience, revealing an overwhelmed hospital with staff doing their best under trying conditions. It was just chaos, really, because the ambulances just didn't stop coming in. So there were people coming in throughout the night. Uh, Waikato is, you know, the trauma centre for um, the Midland region. So people were coming in from all over the region. It did not stop. Um, And the ambulance crew were fantastic. They stayed beside each of the patients with the trolleys that they had, and it was just piled up with patients. While her father eventually got the treatment he needed and his story had a positive outcome, she fears what effects the delays are having on others. There was a woman, an elderly woman beside me. There was no um, ward for her to go to, and she was um, ill, physically ill, and I had to help look after her. There was nobody to look after her. And... I had found a cover that had face cloths in it and was able to wipe her down. But there was no towels, there was um, there was no resources even. It felt like they were just running on a shoestring. This Wellington GP says what's happening in emergency departments is just one aspect of the struggling system. The ED issue is really just a symptom of the, the whole problem. There's no beds. Um, referrals that we're sending through are being declined. Even once patients are in the system and they've been seen by a specialist, um, they're not followed up when they're supposed to be. Referrals for imaging aren't getting done on time. Um, they're not being listed for, well, if they do get listed for surgery, they then wait months and months. And she says the current situation hasn't come out of the blue. It's been building up for, well, at least the last year, uh, but particularly the past six months, it's getting worse and worse. And I'm not really sure why, if it's just that patients have got more health needs, trying to see get a patient to see a psychiatrist is almost impossible at the moment. Australasian College for Emergency Medicine President Dr John Bonning says some ED shifts are functioning with only two-thirds of their normal nursing staff. Today he met for an urgent meeting with Health Minister Andrew Little to lay out the issues. From 2009, how with shorter stays in EDs or the six-hour target, performance improved to about 2015 where it peaked and then since then has deteriorated significantly. So again, this what has occurred in January and February this year you know, has been predictable and that our workforce are suffering, our patients are suffering um, and that somebody needs to take ownership and leadership across the sector of access to hospital for acute patients. While he said the minister didn't make any promises, he is engaged and wants to fix the system. There were discussions around quick gains to be made with improved processes, but things aren't looking good in the short term. We are coming into winter. Uh, There's unprecedented levels of of burnout and staff illness in the sector that needs to be addressed. There is a potential for this winter to be not very pleasant with seasonal illness, a bit of COVID thrown in. Obviously, the vaccination programme is very, very important. But yes, uh, unfortunately, it does have the potential to get worse before it gets better. Andrew Little yesterday confirmed to Checkpoint there are delays in the rollout of the flu vaccine. The vaccine provider was unable to supply it for April the 1st, the typical start date for it, so the vaccination programme will now kick off on the 14th. Mō te hōtaka o te ahi ahi, ko Nita Blake person aho. It's 21 minutes past five and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. Still to come on the programme, some property investors scrape in before new tax changes. Some people are jumping the vaccine queue in Christchurch with leftover jabs being given to people working near vaccination clinics. Canterbury District Health Board says it's to avoid wastage. That's left doctors in the region fuming as frontline health workers are prioritised for spares in other regions. Alicia Foon reports. Canterbury doctors are in the dark over how the Canterbury District Health Board plans to roll out vaccines to keep the region safe. Workers not in high-risk jobs have been jumping the queue to get a COVID-19 dose if they happen to work near a vaccine site to prevent wastage. But Christchurch GP Dr Angus Chambers, who runs a medical clinic in Brickerton, is disappointed medical staff weren't prioritised. He has no idea when he's getting his jab. 
I think it's a, a terrible failing of the system that we haven't managed to do this. It, it, it's not a it's not a good uh, kind of example of partnership in the health system, and um, it seems to uh, trivialise or minimise the risks that our workforce faces. New Zealand's rolling out the Pfizer vaccine, which has to be used within six hours and can't be moved to another location after it has been brought to room temperature and diluted. Christchurch has about seven clinics based at managed quarantine, isolation facilities and at the airport. Canterbury District Health Board confirmed on one occasion it gave doses to three staff members from a company near a vaccination site after some people didn't show up for their appointment. In a statement, its executive lead for COVID-19 response, Ralph LaSalle, says they use a standby list of people within managed isolation and quarantine or port facilities who can be called at short notice to get the dose. And there is a contingency plan in place to prevent wastage of any vaccine supply which is soon to expire. He also says sometimes clinics with leftover doses are in remote locations. But New Zealand Medical Association General Practice Representative and GP Vanessa Weenink says many of the vaccine clinics aren't actually hard to get to and she or her staff would happily drive there. We're talking about the airport as their location of their clinic and plenty of healthcare workers live in close vicinity. Also there's clinics that are working 24-7 that have workers that could contact them at any time and also even the Rickerton Clinic is 10-15 minutes at most away from the airport and would be very easy to be contacted. So I think that's a little bit of a red herring actually. She wants the DHB to collect healthcare workers' contact details and availability in the event of spare doses. I hope the DHB will soon have a very detailed list of availability names and phone numbers uh, for people to be able to contact at short notice. Uh, That's the kind of thing that I would have thought was available and happening anyway, but clearly if they had to grab random people from nearby, uh, they didn't have enough detail to be able to contact people at short notice. Dr Angus Chambers says there are plenty of healthcare workers who aren't working seven days a week and could easily be called up at short notice to drive out to get a dose. He is now seeking answers from the CDHB and government. I would like to see some certainty. I would like to know what's expected of me as a general practitioner in terms of delivering the programme so that I know whether I can be able to deliver it. We need more than a week's warning to be able to get our system up and running. And as a person who's facing the risk of catching the disease, I would like to be vaccinated as soon as possible. And at this stage, I still don't know when that will happen. I've just heard that it might be being rolled out on the 14th of uh, April, but certainly had nothing specific. The Director General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield, says spare COVID vaccines have been given to people outside of the vaccine priority plan since the beginning of the programme in order to avoid wastage. He says on the first weekend of vaccinating border workers, some healthcare workers were vaccinated with spares. I I would imagine that in Canterbury, like everywhere, at the end of the day, if they have uh, vaccines left over, they are they will have a list of people that they will call up to see if they can get them in at short notice to vaccinate them. Managed isolation, quarantine, border workers and their families are expected to be vaccinated by the end of March. Immunising the second group, New Zealand's frontline healthcare workers, and people living in high-risk settings like rest homes has already begun and will continue until May. The rest of the population, which leaves about 2 million people, will start receiving the vaccine from July. For Checkpoint, ko e le shifun And we're keen for your feedback on that one. What should happen to spare vaccines at the end of the day? Who should be given priority? Also, on the Cook Islands travel bubbles, coming sometime in May, uh, both Prime Ministers are hoping, will you be lining up to buy a ticket? You can text us on 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ or send us an email, checkpoint at rnz.co.nz.
The boss of MIQ has pushed pause on exercise excursions beyond the gates of isolation hotels for 24 hours, while a series of botch-ups are investigated. Returnees from the Grand McCure Hotel in downtown Auckland were being bused to a park suburbs away to exercise, but 14 of them have had their isolation stay extended by two weeks after a guest who tested positive for COVID while out walking was allowed back on the bus to the hotel with more than a dozen other guests. Since then, genome sequencing has linked that returnee with another McCure guest infected with the same UK strain of the virus, raising concerns that COVID's been allowed to spread inside the hotel. Head of MIQ, Brigadier Jim Bliss, says the bus trips offered at four Auckland isolation hotels are off for now. Last night I put a 24-hour pause on the busing of returnees to manage isolation walks. This will allow the staff the opportunity to review their processes and ensure that the protocols are appropriate. We will also be reminding staff about our need to always remain vigilant and provide clear direction to returnees about the adherence to infection, prevention and control measures. Brigadier Bliss apologised to those forced to spend an extra two weeks in isolation because of the slip-up and said they had been given the option to shift to another isolation hotel. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge those 14 returnees uh, that have had their time managed, uh, managed isolation extended. I know it's a disruption to their plans and they may be uh, feeling a little angry. Uh, we are doing what we can to make their extended stay as comfortable uh, as we can. Uh, but I would hope that they would understand this with a due amount of caution for their safety and well-being while we've had to extend them. But I do extend my sincere thanks to them for their understanding and patience. The suspected transmission of COVID within the Grand Mercure also means hundreds of past guests need to be tracked down and retested. Here's the Director General of Health. Our contact tracing team was hard at work yesterday contacting those 250 returnees who have subsequently left the hotel uh, since the 10th of March and asking them to be tested and to remain isolated until that test results received. Uh, as at 9am this morning, 193 of those 250 people had been contacted. I expect that figure is uh, even higher now. The remaining people are being followed up this morning. Meanwhile, Dr Bloomfield says 5,000 Pfizer jabs will be given over the weekend as the immunisation programme ramps up. Still, we thought there were a few questions to be answered around the situation at the McCure. We asked both Brigadier Bliss and the DG of Health on the programme tonight, but neither of them were available. A global luxury car brand has dropped New Zealand's UFC star Israel Adesanya as its brand manager over comments he would rape an opponent. Adesanya has apologised, but the fallout continues. Jeremy Rees reports. It began with trash talk. Kevin Holland is a UFC middleweight fighter known as much for his mouth as his punches, and he's been in a war of words with any opponent, including Adesanya, for months. In an Instagram post, he intimated he could sexually attack his next opponent. A diss on your bit. In a post, he told his 4 million followers on Instagram he would rape Holland. Debbie Tohill of Rape Prevention Education was stunned. We say that it's a, a, a random comment or, you know, he hasn't really thought about what he's saying. But actually, if we live in a society where it's OK to say things like that, it actually sets a platform where sexual violence is normalised. Totok on my sexual harm support looks after survivors in the Bay of Plenty. It said the use of explicit language to taunt a competitor was wrong, and it said the Post was downplaying sexual harm. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Sport Grant Robertson was off to the Halberg Awards when he spoke to Radio New Zealand's first up. The same Halberg Awards where Adesanya was named Sportsman of the Year just 12 months ago. There's never a time to make flippant comments about rape. It's just not something anybody should do. I'm sure Israel understands that. I believe he has deleted the tweet in question. Um, you know, and, I, and I'm, you know, it'll be up to the UFC as to what they do, but... I'd certainly be making clear to him and to anybody, actually, that we have to take rape seriously. It's not an issue that anyone should be making jokes or flippant comments about at all. This morning, Adesanya responded. On his official Twitter account, he issued an apology. He said he was sorry. He said he understood now how his words could hurt people beyond his opponent, and he'd never intended that. Adesanya said he would take it as a lesson to choose his words more wisely and says he is still learning how to be in the spotlight. His fans largely supported him on social media. 
A sponsor didn't. This afternoon, BMW announced that in light of our Dissonia's comments, it's decided to drop him as its upcoming brand ambassador. For Checkpoint, Jeremy Rees. up on Checkpoint on RNZ National. The hammer goes down on the last property sales before new tax rules come into force. No jab, no pint. We find out how UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson's idea has gone down with pubs. And we would love your feedback on anything you've heard on the programme this evening. You can get in touch via text 2101 or tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ. The email is checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Time for the headlines now with Marama. The COVID response minister, Chris Hipkins, says while the government is trying to be as sensitive as possible, there will be no expansion to the rules covering MIQ exemptions on compassionate grounds. The issue has arisen following a video of a crying woman in a managed isolation facility reaching out as a hearse carrying her mother's coffin drives by. Cook Island's Prime Minister says his tourism-reliant country is ready for a two-way travel bubble and he is confident quarantine-free travel will start in May. Mark Brown has held meetings with Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern in Wellington today. The Cook Islands vaccination campaign and $20 million additional support from New Zealand were discussed. A faith-based abuse survivor group says the Catholic Church's apology to people abused in its care is not acceptable. Cardinal John Dew has said sorry at the Royal Commission into Abuse and Care in Auckland. But the director of the Survivors Network of those abused by priests, Christopher Longhurst, says it needs to be accompanied by personal apologies to each victim. A Christchurch doctor believes the DHB needs a better plan for dealing with leftover vaccines. The Canterbury District Health Board found itself with three leftover doses when people didn't turn up for the Pfizer vaccination. They were given to staff at a nearby company. Dr Vanessa Weenink says the DHB needs a detailed list of people they can contact at short notice rather than give the vaccine to random people. A fishing boat master has been fined $13,000 for not deploying seabird protection equipment while long lining for tuna and swordfish. David McHale has appeared by audio-visual link before a judge in the Napier District Court and fined for offending on 20 occasions. And a body found in a wooded area of Invercargill is believed to be that of missing man Raymond Horn. The 68-year-old disappeared from a city rest home more than five weeks ago. Those are the headlines. Our next news and sports update is at six. Thanks, Marama. If you're just joining us, this is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. And it's time now for the business news. Friday treat, Nona Peltier joins me in the studio. Hi, Nona. Let's talk first about this household survey, right? It's found that people are more optimistic about their current employment, but less certain about their future. Why so? Well, it's another one of these stories about the COVID uh, pandemic and what impact that's having on all sorts of different parts of our lives and jobs are no different. So what's really happened is that, you know, we talk about the global financial crisis and draw some parallels between that and COVID, but there are some stark differences. So during the global financial crisis, it took six years before job ads returned to normal levels. Now it's only been six months. So job job ads are at normal levels, the levels we've seen in the past, and that's nothing unusual about that. But it's the mix of jobs that are available that's causing people to feel a little less certain about their future. So it's affecting women more than it's affecting men because the jobs that really disappeared with the... Um, the shortage of international visitors and so on, that has really affected women more than men because they are in jobs in retail and hospitality and so on. And so they're the ones who've been mostly displaced. And they are also the people who are on lower incomes. So those that are on higher incomes are more confident. Those who are in trades and those types of jobs Mm. are more confident. And the ones who've been wondering where they're going to find their next paycheck uh, are uh, far less confident. And and we're going to continue to see that for some time because uh, there's been this skills mismatch. And when, uh, you know, job opportunities open up again, you would expect there to be a shift away. So we have as many people employed overall, but not necessarily in the jobs that people want. Interesting. Now, you've got a result for us, which is Helen Stein's Glassons, right? So, and it's got a strong first half profit. What did they make? Because nobody was leaving the house for, for various <laughs> points in time, so you didn't need kind of 
Funny you, you should mention really? that. Okay, yes. Happy with it. No, well, no. I will because that's reflected in this result. As a matter of fact, okay. Lisa, you'd be happy to know that um, the the company made a very strong result, uh, which is great news for Han- Hel- uh, Helen Stein. Uh, they had let's see, their profit was. $19.8 million. That's an increase of 29% on the year earlier. And their online sales were up more than, well, about 24%. Interestingly, their women's clothing in Australia, that, those sales rose 27%. In New Zealand, just 14.5%. But when it came to men's garments, it was down 1.2% because men have stopped buying those tailored items that we'd expect, like the tie and the suit and so on. Even that surprised me, Nona, because everybody was Zooming and teaming and whatever. You could only be seen from the waist up, and half the time, if you turned your camera off, you only needed your pyjamas. Well, maybe they've been buying their pyjamas, because we they certainly haven't been buying tailored products, that's for certain. Interesting how it's a cultural shift. It's all across, all the, the most surprising things you discover because of COVID. Right, go. and have you brought some market numbers with you today, Yeah, I Nona? did now, but all my papers have got... Oh. skewed because of your question. There we go. Here we go. Right. I've got it right in front of me here. The NZX Top 50 Index. Yes, it rose a third of a percent today. 39 points to 12,349. And the New Zealand dollar is trading at 69.7 US cents, 92.6 Australian and 50.6 pence. And those market numbers are very much in line with what we've seen in Asia today. Okay, thanks, Nona. Nona Peltier there. I want to know if your habits, your clothing habits, have changed as a result of COVID. Are you buying different things? Have you stopped buying clothes? Let us know. Text us on 2101, tweet us at Checkpoint RNZ, or email checkpoint at rnz.co.nz. Investors who bought a house today will have scraped in on avoiding the government's extension to the Bright Line test. Any property purchases that are not the family home made from next week will now be liable to pay tax on profits if sold before 2030. Emma Hatton went to an auction house in Wellington today where two homes went under the hammer. It's on a perfect setting, isn't it? The section is safe and secure, well fenced uh, for your loved ones, whether they have two legs or four. You don't have to worry about them. This weather clad beauty. This is where a three bedroom really home on 915 square metres in the lower hut suburb of Wainuia Mata. At $910,000, ladies and gentlemen, selling it, selling it. Congratulations, and a 100 square metre apartment off Cuba Street in the city centre sold by a property investor. You can live in it or let it out. It wouldn't matter what you did. Capital gain and assurance of buying in a top location are absolutely assured here, ladies and gentlemen. But snapped up by a first home buyer. We're surprised to get it, but happy to. Shaking up a little bit. It's kind of an intense situation to be in an auction. Antonia Brown from Harcourts Wellington says the announcement on Tuesday had done little to change buyer and seller behaviour so far, with neither of these auctions brought forward to get in before the Brightline test extension kicked in. We did suggest it to a few, but um, they all felt that the markets, you know, most people in the market are in there for the long haul, and um, so we didn't tempt anybody to do that. We tried though. Property investor Steve Goody agrees, saying most investors have a portfolio plan and are in it for the long haul. But some are making changes. Some people have cancelled their plans to sell properties. A lot of people are looking at when they purchase their property with this new Brightline test issue. There's a lot of confusion out there because obviously they're rushing this law through and it's, it's law tomorrow. Um, and there's really no detail. He says the changes introduced to discourage investors won't help the housing crisis. I certainly think it'll give people a a pause to think about future investments in real estate in New Zealand, but it's also put an awful lot of pressure, believe it or not, on developers. We don't have the materials, we don't have the tradespeople, we don't have the apprentices to build stuff quickly enough to fulfil that need in the marketplace. Another property investor, Lindsay Calvey-Freeman, has started a petition which has more than 8,000 signatures calling for the government to reverse its planned policy on interest deductibility, saying it's unfair. Any business can claim interest as an expense. You know, if you're a trucking company and you need to borrow money to buy a truck, you can deduct the interest from your taxable income uh, because it's a a cost incurred to provide that service. I mean, the same is true if you borrow to buy a house to rent out. I mean, the general principle of income tax is that the government gets a slice of what you get. What they're doing here is wanting a slice of something you don't even get. 
He says the majority of landlords are amateur and haven't raised rents in line with what the market would tolerate. So if they were to take a loss under the new changes, raising rents wouldn't be out of the question. He says it's either that or an exodus. If investors all left the market, there'd be a big, a big issue because not everyone, even if prices dropped, would be in a position to buy a house. And, you know, <laughs> unless, unless the government can come up with a, enough money to purchase all the rentals out there as social houses, there's going to be an issue. He says the plan changes have caused him to rethink purchasing another property. And that's something property lawyer Michael Hoffman Body says he has seen in the few days since the announcement. What I did see is a couple of people who opted to not purchase properties which they were looking to buy as investments they decided they wouldn't tender for properties. He says he also had inquiries around bringing settlements forward so they were done and dusted before the weekend. Mō te hōtaka o te ahiponei, ko e Manhattan tēnei. Arahui will be placed on an area in Fovo Strait following the discovery of a deadly parasite that could put the entire bluff oyster trade at risk. Three wild oysters were found to be infected during routine surveillance, four years after a huge cull to get rid of the parasite from other oyster growing regions. Riley Kennedy reports. Bonamia Austria was first found in New Zealand in the Marlborough Sound six years ago and then again in 2017 from oysters in Big Glory Bay on Stewart Island. The threat back then then led to the removal of oyster farms in Stewart Island and Marlborough. A crisis meeting was held in Invercargill today with local stakeholders feeling anxious about the discovery. Ministry for Primary Industries Biosecurity Manager Kath Duthie acknowledged the concern but says the meeting was constructive. She says intensive sampling is needed to figure out exactly what the problem is and the Rahui will aid that. Now this will be in the form of a legal uh, notice whereby we prohibit any fishing or recreation in a very small area that's um, just off the about four to five nautical miles east of the saddle off Rakiora. So it's a very small area. It shouldn't affect people very much at all. Kath Duffy says testing will be carried out in the area. We do need to know exactly uh, how large this infection is and that will give us really good guidance on how we manage this going forward. Ms Duffy says for the moment fishing can continue outside of the Rahui zone. The Bluff Oyster Management Company's General Manager, Graham Wright, says the news of the discovery was devastating. Obviously, you know, it was devastating when it first hit um, Big Glory Bay, um, you know, back in 2017. Um, and we always hoped that it would never uh, make its way into the Straits, but um, I guess yeah, that was always hopeful. <laughs> However, Mr Wright says the meeting was positive and there is a clear way forward. The way forward is just to, to really understand what we're up against, so... Um, as I said, it's a, it's a very small area that, that's currently been detected um, and, and it's a very small amount of oysters, um, very localised, so uh, there'll be an extensive, um, uh, everyone's committed to an extensive uh, testing and monitoring programme, so to know exactly where we are um, and then we'll make a bit of a plan from there. Meanwhile, Bluff Community Board Chair Ryan Fife says the community is in shock and locals are fearing for worrying times ahead. Mr Fife says the local bluff economy relies heavily on the oyster trade. Through the oyster season, it's it's quite a number of people employed and it's not only the, the people fishing, it's the oyster openers, there's the businesses around bluff and the engineering firms that do um, day-to-day maintenance on the oyster boats as well. Raymond Fife says locals were up in arms during the last outbreak. Particularly the, the concern that it was at Stewart Island and the concern that you know, could quite easily spread to Fovo Strait because this, this strain of parasites is deadly and, and it has got the potential to wipe out the whole oyster industry. While the parasite is incredibly dangerous to oysters, it doesn't affect food safety. More meetings with stakeholders will be held in the next few weeks to sort out the issue. For Checkpoint, Riley Kennedy. It's quarter to six. I'm Lisa Owen and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. After six tonight, is the prospect of a May travel bubble too late for the cooks, with hundreds of people heading offshore to find work? A giant container ship remains stuck in the Suez Canal in Egypt, one of the busiest trade routes in the world. The Japanese owner of the vessel has apologised for disrupting global trade. The 400 metre long ship, Ever Given, is stacked high with containers and ran aground after strong winds pushed it off course. 
Officials say it could take up to a week to clear, and now there are some 200 ships stuck behind it. John Defteros reports. A traffic jam like no other in the world of trade. At least 160 ships are waiting to transit through the Suez Canal after efforts to dislodge the giant vessel wedged across it failed. Attempts were made to free the 224,000 ton ever given using eight tugboats and dredging the surrounding mud and sand. But so far, the vessel won't budge. Canal authorities suspended traffic through the vital waterway Thursday when it became clear the rescue plan wasn't going to be quick or easy. A team of Dutch and Japanese salvage experts were drafted in to help and express caution over the time it could take. It can be days to weeks, depending on what you come across. You have to realize that the equipment you need is, of course, not necessarily around the corner. Around 12% of the world trade volume passes through the canal normally, and it usually handles the equivalent of $10 billion a day in cargo. Industry experts are concerned if the situation is not resolved soon, there could be a big impact on the oil market, shipping and container rates, leading to a rise in the cost of goods we all depend on. The Ever Given first became stuck on Tuesday after being caught in high winds and a ferocious sandstorm, which caused low visibility and poor navigation. Its owner, Japanese shipping company Shoei Kizan KK, is bracing itself for lawsuits from affected parties, but says their main focus at this critical juncture is refloating the ship. And that's CNN's John Defterios reporting there. Let's head to the UK now, where a no-jab, no-pint plan has fallen, well, flat with some publicans. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has floated the possibility of banning people from pubs unless they can produce a COVID vaccination certificate once the nationwide rollout is complete. But some bar owners don't want to be the COVID pub police. We caught up with publican Jimmy Duke Evans as he was powering down for the night. Hello, Lisa. Yeah, are you all right? I'm all tucked up in bed, but I'm ready to go for you guys. Talk us through this suggestion from Boris. What does he want you to do? Well, it, you never really know from one minute to the next with this guy. Um, but the latest, it seems, is that they're looking at the ideas of um, saying to people that you better get your vaccine jab because otherwise... You, you might not be allowed into the pubs without having like a, you know, like a vaccine passport or a, you know, a certificate of being jabbed. Um, and I think part of what they're trying to do is to get the young, the younger people who are like a bit less asked to do this. Like the oldies are kind of on board with it. You know, my folks have had, have had both of their jabs now, which is really good because, because my old man's, 90 next year my mum's 80 next year but apparently the younger ones are not really feeling it quite so much and they're and they're a lot more complacent so it seems like boris is saying how are we going to get these guys to do it let's tell them they can't go to the pub unless they can prove that they've had it done like if they're if they're putting the responsibility um like for all of the the awkwardness and all of the arguments that will come from it, from loads of stupid, dumbass COVID deniers, like let us in, come on, we want our beer, and and we're if we're the ones that are stuck, basically saying, like you can't do it. If we're the ones that are on the door doing it, tiny little places um, are not going to have the budget for the security people to be able to do this it's just foisting something onto publicans whereas you know if if they if the government were really so serious about it um, and they really needed that result then they'd make it a mandatory vaccination so i'm just trying to see how this would play out in my head jimmy so can you talk me through it what you'd be at the door or, or do you wait for them to come to the counter and they say oh, i'll have i'll have a pint of that one there and you say um can you just show me your certificate yeah i mean i, I think it would have to be an at the door thing because you know if they're if they're already indoors in a in an environment where it could where it could spread potentially more rapidly, um, then that can't really happen. So I think this is, you know, this is going to be queues of people um, who are potentially all queuing together, maybe not socially distanced, um, with security people on the door probably. Um, and, it, you know, I, I don't know what, what kind of blue language we're allowed on your show, but it would be, it would be some kind of show beginning with S, and I know that.
<laughs> you don't want to be the pub police then. That's the deal, Jimmy, for you? No, we don't want to have to. Listen, we're, it's our calling to entertain people and to do it safely and to work within the rules in order to make things, uh, to, to make people's lives a little bit happier and a little bit easier. Um, you know, the, the, the Brits, probably much like people all around the world, uh, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll drink when they're up and they'll drink when they're down. And everybody here is absolutely chomping at the bit to be able to have a few pints. Um, And the thing is, if the government needs people to be vaccinated in order to do it, it's not really fair to put it on small independent publicans in order to force that conversation because there are a lot of dumb people out there that are not um, keen on following the rules and not have got no interest whatsoever in protecting themselves or their families. Um, And they're also coincidentally exactly the same people that are really, really argumentative at the door of your local pub. Hey, Jimmy, speaking of being desperate for a bevy, how long have you guys had to be shut up for? Uh, we've been... Oh, man, I see. I mean, our, our little bar section, that's been, that's been dead as a dodo for probably... I mean, it's, it's coming up on a year, really. We had a little, we had a little bit in the summertime um where we had kind of a you know a period of a couple of months where we could actually uh actually serve people but there were distancing rules in place um and you know you'd still get people calling up every week saying oh, right you're allowed to have a wedding um with up to 30 people can we just say that my birthday party is a wedding and we'd just be like no we're not in the business of uh of trying to circumvent public health uh, recommendations just so that you can have a hooli. Now, people are, people are going to be really excited to get out and about. And there's kind of like, a, you know, everyone's got their mental countdown as to when they can get out there. And a lot of the pubs have been taking bookings. Uh, our bookings open next week. Um, and we anticipate that, you know, the place is going to be absolutely packed. So before you go, what's your message for Boris? <laughs> oh my god, where do we start? Uh my message to Boris would be step aside. And that was Brixton publican Jimmy Duke Evans. Under the cover of darkness this morning, a milestone was celebrated in the efforts to increase the number of kōkako. From a population of just 300 breeding pairs in the late 90s, the North Island kōkako now boasts 2,000 pairs. Hundreds of environmentalists, iwi members and Department of Conservation staff gathered in the Pūrerua forest at dawn. Our Taranaki Whanganui reporter Robin Martin headed into the forest with them. That's a dawn chorus in the Puriora forest near Taupo. Heading into the bush in the early hours of the day was Department of Conservation Kōkako recovery lead Elsa Corkery. She says today was about celebrating the landmark of Kōkako recovery and those who helped achieve it. We separated into four groups and we slowly walked the Waipapa loop track um, listening to the dawn chorus, listening out for Kōkako. We're pretty lucky. There was a, a few that put on uh, quite a quite a display for us. Um, yeah, so I think everyone's having a good time. Ms. Corkery says the key to the program's success is simple. A lot of hard work on the ground, predator control. It's really rats and possums in the forest. A lot of um, habitat restoration. We've done a lot of translocations. So of the 25 populations we currently have, only 11 are relict. All the rest have been translocated, our new populations started. Ms Corkery says although 1080 had played its part, two-thirds of Kōkako populations are now managed by iwi and community groups and their contribution could not be underestimated. John Innes was working for the New Zealand Forestry Service in the Puriora area during the 1980s when he became involved in the drive to save the Kōkako. I think they got down to about eight or nine pairs in this little area and in the Mangatutu catchment, which is sort of near Otorohonga, at, at the other end, it would be down to a similar number. So pest control started at both ends, at this end by um, Department of Conservation and at the other end by um, community groups. And now those two populations have, m- have merged in the middle and made this very large one we have now. The Puriora area now has an estimated 490 breeding pairs.
Today was an emotional moment for Mr Innes. Complex, heart lifting, just inspiring, extraordinary. It just shows that you can bring back these birds, you know, from quite palace numbers. I mean, we're just celebrating 2,000 pairs this weekend. It's taken us 30 years, you know, to get here. The key thing is the trend. I mean, that number can go up and up and up. Francis Hughes is a coordinator for the Kaitiaki group Te Hokainga o Puriora, which co-hosted today's event. For the Rere Ahu iwi member, it was bittersweet. When we were growing up here as kids, we heard the kōkako, you know, so it was a normal thing for us. It was just part of our everyday life. When the logging stopped, that's when things changed, and it was because of the kōkako. So they stopped the logging, which meant our livelihoods were affected, our families disintegrated, they had to move away because of the kōkako. But nobody explained to us what that was going to look like and what was going to happen. It just happened. Ms Hughes says Iwi had only recently joined in the effort to save kōkako. So for the last 35, 40 years we haven't been involved, we haven't been actively involved in any of the research, in any of the studies, any of the projects, because we didn't know. So um, we made it our, our job to go out and find out, well, what is this all about? So we went to Doc and said, well, we want to know more. You know, what are you doing with these birds? Why are you taking them away from our home? So we got on board to learn, learn more. And I'm just so grateful that we did. She says iwi members have rediscovered how precious the kōkako and other taonga species are. Her moko, 10-year-old Tali Rata, went on the dawn walk. It was like scary at first because I couldn't see the lodge. But then when we um, stopped to look at the kōkako, I forgot all about it. And we heard the deer roaring. Yeah, and it was pretty cool. But it sounded like creepy-ish. But she also heard kōkako. They were like really cool because my um, my brother George, he was like singing hard, like like trying to communicate with them and stuff. Yeah, and it was pretty cool. And are you happy that there are more kōkako now than there were before? Yeah, I'm really happy about that. It's hoped if current trends continue, it may be possible to remove the North Island kōkako from the endangered list by 2038. I Puriora Motihotaka o Te Ahiahinei, ko Robin Martin Aho. And before the news at six, some feedback on vaccines. This person says vaccine absolutely shouldn't be going to waste if there are a few days left at the end of the day. I'm sure most people would understand if nurses ask people on the street outside if they would like it. The priority should surely be getting people jabbed with as little waste as possible. Others of you agree as well. Uh, this person says when vaccinators who have been injecting for 12 long hours find out that at eight o'clock when they have finished a long, long shift, Shift. There are two vaccinations left over. It is ridiculous to expect them to start ringing up doctors and waiting another hour to get rid of the last couple of vaccines. And the doctor who thinks they should be doing that doesn't live in the real world. However, Yvonne has got in touch to say, think that could be so open to manipulation, says Yvonne, i.e. bribes, friends, etc. Not happy. I work with elderly in care facility but have no idea when we will be vaccinated. Would think that as most people who have died from COVID-19 are in that cohort, arrangements would be made, says Yvonne. Uh, and on the subject of the Rarotonga bubble, this person says, how disappointing we booked flights and accommodation for April for the term break. RNZ News, uh, good evening, I'm Marama Papal. Spur COVID vaccines have been given to people outside of the vaccine priority plan in order to avoid wastage. Canterbury District Health Board gave leftover Pfizer doses to three staff members from a company near a vaccination site after some people didn't show up for their appointment. The Director General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield, says on the first weekend of vaccinating border workers, some healthcare workers were vaccinated with spears. I, I would imagine that in Canterbury, like everywhere, at the end of the day, if they have uh, vaccines left over, they, are, they will have a list of people that they will call up to see if they can get them in at short notice to vaccinate them. The Director General of Health, Ashley Bloomfield. 
The head of managed isolation and quarantine says they'll look at the safety risks if there are further funeral processions to MIQ hotels. A funeral home in Auckland drove a hearse to a MIQ facility so a woman in isolation could bid farewell to her late mother. The head of managed isolation and quarantine, Brigadier Jim Bliss, says he didn't know about the funeral procession in advance. He says if there are further cases, they may need to make plans on how to manage it. We would have to... Um consider what the effect would be on not only the facility itself, but you know, remember that a lot of our facilities are in um, built-up areas in, for example, Auckland. Um, you know, the, is there public safety? Is there policing uh, effects which would you know, make that an unsafe activity in itself? Brigadier Jim Bliss says they need to ensure they balance public safety and health. The Cook Islands Prime Minister canvassed the significant issues facing, facing his country at a meeting with his New Zealand counterpart in Auckland today. Mark Brown is the first international leader to visit the country in a year. He and Jacinda Ardern talked about the roadmap for quarantine-free travel, pledging to work towards a May travel bubble. And New Zealand confirmed $20 million in additional support for the islands this financial year. Mark Brown says his nation is ready to return to business after the hit from COVID. We're a country that is totally reliant on tourism, up to 70% of GDP. Uh, this has had a significant impact on our, on our uh, economy um, to the state where it's declined 20% in the same period that New Zealand's economy has declined by 2.9% of its GDP. Cook Islands Prime Minister Mark Brown. A jury has found a former child, youth and family carer guilty of sexually violating and indecently assaulting young boys in his care. Earl William Opetaya ran an Auckland SIFS home in the early to mid-2000s, caring for around 150 boys over a five-year period. Six of these boys accused him of indecently assaulting them. He faced charges including sexual violation, threatening to kill and supply of cannabis. Today in the High Court at Auckland, the jury found him guilty of 21 out of 26 charges. Rahui will be placed on an area in Fovo Strait following the, the discovery of a deadly parasite affecting oysters. Three wild oysters have been found to be infected with Bonamia austriae four years after a huge cull to get rid of it from other oyster growing regions. Officials from Biosecurity New Zealand met locals today in Southland to plan a way forward. MPI Biosecurity Manager Kath Dothy says intensive sampling is needed to figure out exactly what the problem is and the Rahui will aid that. We do need to know exactly uh, how large this infection is and that will give us really good guidance on how we manage this going forward. Dr Kath Dothy acknowledged locals were anxious about the discovery. A rare artwork by Vincent van Gogh has finally been sold at auction after confusion saw the painting sold twice in the same day. Ross Cullen reports from Paris. Seine de Rue à Montmartre was painted in 1887 during van Gogh's two-year stay in Paris. It's been in the hands of one family since 1920 and has never been on public display. On Thursday, the painting was about to be sold, but as the hammer was falling, a last-second internet bid came in. That bid was lodged as the final offer, but minutes after confirming the sale, the auction house in Paris annulled it due to confusion over whether that final bid arrived in time. The painting sold for $22 million. Central Christchurch has seen a spike in push bike thefts, with police warning cyclists to properly lock up their cycles. Senior Sergeant Roy Appleby says in the past six weeks, Christchurch has seen over 166 bike thefts worth a quarter of a million dollars. The thefts are taking place outside commercial or retail outlets, even when bikes are locked up and in broad daylight. Senior Sergeant Appleby says every push bike owner should be taking care to lock up or store bikes bikes wisely, especially outside universities, gyms, malls and high schools. Five arrests have been made so far. It's five minutes past six. New Zealand are closing in on victory in the final cricket one day against Bangladesh in Wellington. Set a total of 319 to win. The visitors are struggling against the Black Caps bowlers. Matt Henry has picked up four wickets and Jimmy Neesham has taken three wickets to tear through the Bangladesh batting lineup. A short time ago, Bangladesh were 103 for eight after 33 overs. New Zealand lead the three match series 2 0. 
Winless in their three games so far, the Hurricanes know their task gets no easier tonight when they play the Highlanders in Dunedin. The Highlanders have just one win, but Hurricanes coach Jason Holland has been impressed with their performances so far and knows the visitors will have to improve markedly if they're to chalk up their first win. You know when you play the Highlanders, they're going to have a bit going on in attack and they have a real mindset around winning the game line, winning momentum, quick ball, you know, Nuggie's going to get in there and clear the ball well and quickly, you know. So, you know, we need to be able to stop that and, and make sure that we can apply pressure when we attack. So I love playing under the roof and I love to try and play with tempos. That's just going to be a cracker, I think. The match kicks off at five past seven. Auckland sprinter Zoe Hobbs has equaled the 100 metre women's national record set almost 30 years ago. Hobbs has won the New Zealand title at the National Track and Field Champs in Hastings, winning the final in 11.32 seconds, matching the long standing mark set by Michelle Seymour 28 years ago. That's the news. Tonight on Nights, Fat Freddy's drop member and log cabin radio host Slave also known as Mark Williams, selects the mixtape. There's plenty brewing on Country Life, where well, there's the hop harvest for a start. Our Friday Night Live act is a Dave McCartney tribute show recorded at Auckland's Power Station. And because the one for polio was first announced on this day in 1953, we've got a sonic tonic dedicated to vaccines on nights with me, Brian Crump, after the news at 7 on RNZ National. Is your Met Service forecast at midnight Saturday. Northland and Coromandel Peninsula, a few showers. Auckland to Wellington, including Bay of Plenty and the Central High Country, mainly fine. However, isolated showers out and about and north of Taiape. Gisborne to Wider up, Upper, fine, apart from areas of morning cloud or fog. Marlborough, Nelson, Buller and Northern Westland, fine today, apart from areas of cloud. A few showers developing tomorrow. South Westland and Fiordland, a few showers turning to rain tomorrow with some heavy falls from the afternoon. Canterbury and Otago, mainly fine with high cloud. Patchy light rain developing south of Ashburton tomorrow. South and cloudy with light rain at times and Chatham Island's cloudy periods. It's seven minutes past six. Good evening. Thanks, Marama. If you're just joining us, this is Checkpoint and I'm Lisa Owen. The Cook Islands Prime Minister has been promised $20 million, but no firm date for the start of a travel bubble with New Zealand. Mark Brown sat down with Jacinda Ardern in Auckland today for a chance to tell the Prime Minister the significant issues facing his COVID-free but also tourist-free country. Katie Todd reports. We're a country that is totally reliant on tourism, up to 70% of GDP. Uh, this has had a significant impact on our on our uh, economy um, to the state where it's declined 20% in the same period that New Zealand's economy has declined by 2.9% of its GDP. Brown hasn't been in MIQ, instead making use of the one-way quarantine-free travel to New Zealand arrangement that has been in place since January. At least 300 Cook Islands workers have also come here and there's pressure for officials to move faster on a two-way travel bubble or risk losing a significant chunk of the Cook Islands workforce to New Zealand. Today the leaders wouldn't set a date but promised to work in earnest towards a travel bubble in May. In the meantime, New Zealand has offered up a sweetener. New Zealand has recently reprioritised our development assistance budget to be able to make available $20 million in additional support for the Cook Islands this financial year. Ardern said New Zealand needs to do everything it can to prepare for a travel bubble, given that it carries more risk than the Cook Islands. The leaders weren't specific about what's causing the hold-up. Uh, there are some areas that we do need uh, to find agreement on in terms of um, uh, issues uh, that need to be sorted out, but. Uh, we're confident that we will have those in place uh, by May. However, Jacinda Ardern says vaccines will help pave the way for the two-way travel bubble. New Zealand has already purchased enough jabs for the Cooks, Tokelau and Nui and pledged to help its Pacific neighbours out with their vaccine programmes. The Director-General of Health has also advised that beginning vaccination will add to the safe opening of quarantine free travel as well. Cabinet will be working with our Cook Island counterparts to expedite that joint vaccination plan over the coming weeks. Next week, Mark Brown is expected to meet with New Zealand's Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Finance, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister for COVID-19 Response, among other leaders. For Checkpoint, call Katie Todd, TNA. 
So the Cook's travel bubble announcement has left some deflated with few details other than May as the hoped for start date. With Rarotonga estimated to be losing a million dollars a day in tourism, Fletcher Melvin from the Cook Islands Chamber of Commerce was a little underwhelmed with today's reveal. Knowing what, what we're going through, and here we are still um, with these vague dates, these vague promises, um, I think it's very disappointing. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say it, but um, we've now, I, I think it's time that we started to ask some hard questions about why um, no one, that there's no com- commitment by um, you know, New Zealand um, government to open up um, to the Cook Islands. I mean, it's just it's very, it's very um, disappointing. Why do you see it as a lack of commitment from the New Zealand government? What do you see as the problem here? If they're not communicating directly what needs to be done in the Cook Islands, um, and and we all thought that we had um, ticked all the boxes at, to this stage. So I I don't know. I we we're, we're sort of still guessing what exactly New Zealand needs from us. So you know, just some something something concrete for for once. So um, we can all get um, yeah, we can all we can all uh, at least try and reach those goals, whatever they are. What are the hard questions that you want answers to? Um, so what needs to be done on this end? Exactly what needs to be done? What are the things that um, maybe that New Zealand perceives we haven't covered? Um, if they are if they are things that, uh, um, you know, to do with equipment that's lacking on this end, if it's things to do with protocols, if it's things to do with um, training or capacity, then for goodness sake, uh, tell us what it is. Exactly what it is, and let's uh, let's spend some money and um, and get this fixed. So uh, you know we can we can um, get back to uh, getting our economy back on its feet um, because I think it requires some honest and frank discussion and and uh, frank direction from New Zealand, um, and not the sort of vague uh, these vague answers that we seem to be getting. Your Prime Minister says the Cooks is ready. Is New Zealand being too paternalistic towards Rarotonga? Um, well, in the past, I was I would be hesitant to uh, to criticise um, the New Zealand government. Um, I mean, it, they've done such a great job um, with looking after themselves, uh, looking after the New Zealand. But um, yes, I think they are. I think at this point, um, they need to uh, just be upfront and and tell us and work and let's 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 do everything possible um, to get uh, things in place, things that they think that we we, we require. Um, but this vagueness is, is just, um, you know, depressing. And uh, Cook Islanders are leaving now. We're, they, um, there's a lot of people leaving the country, which we have been saying that's going to happen. And, um, yes, all, the, all our worst-case scenarios are playing out. People are leaving the country. Um, you know, companies um, are deciding they... That they, that they can't stay open much longer. Every day we lose a million dollars in um, in revenue. So we're talking about, um, you know, we're talking about potentially $40 million. And I believe that uh, New Zealand has committed $20 million. And that's just for the functioning of government. That So how does the private sector um, continue? You know, that, that, that kind of money is not going to um, um, service all of the, the private sector debt that, that's mounting. I'm not wanting to put words into your mouth, Fletcher, but has today been a bit of a visit for you in terms of the announcement? Yeah, it has, and I think it's it's probably a visit to our um, delegation as well. Um, you know, I think they were optimistic that um, they would come away with something a bit more concrete. Um, Do you think, Fletcher, uh, they expected an actual date to be able to announce something more specific and solid? I think so. I think uh, the, the government would have liked to come back with a... Um, with a firm date, um, they know that that is the expectation here. That is what um, businesses here have been waiting for. Um, I know that the, the, the prime minister is um, is really keen to um, um, have a date, and he's and uh, they've been um, you know doing everything possible to to um, support businesses. So he understands what sort of um, um, you know a dilemma that uh, we face. So um, yeah, I'm just I, I can imagine what he's thinking. So you just you can't understand why you're in this situation right now. No, I mean I don't think anybody could have walked away from that um, news conference with any firm uh, answers. Always, always vague.
and there's never really any commitment. I guess that maybe that's diplomatic speak and, and things that uh, the private sector can't really get their heads around, uh, why people just can't be um, frank and uh, and uh, give us some direction um, so we can um, make some concrete plans. Is our Prime Minister messing you around? <laughs> Well, I'm going to be a bit diplomatic and, and say that uh, they need to treat us like adults um, and uh, just, yeah, just tell us exactly what uh, they require and let's get down to doing that. So if you want them to treat you like adults, Fletcher, how do you think they're treating you right now? <laughs> well, I think you said um, paternally. I think that's exactly what they're, they're doing. They're, they're, being, they're trying to be paternal. Um, uh, which makes us, um, if they're trying to be paternal, that, that makes us feel like uh, children, I guess. Uh, I'm just disappointed. I think we're all, we're all a bit disappointed. Um, you know, if they said May and they said May the 15th or May the 10th and they put a date on it, um, we would not, you know, we would uh, accept that. But this idea that it could be May um, just means that it's probably not. Um, if, the, if history is, to, is, is anything to go by. So um, that's that's sort of what we're going to walk away with thinking. And that is Fletcher Melbourne from the Cook Islands Chamber of Commerce. And we talked earlier to the Cook Islands Prime Minister, Mark Brown, who is adamant that these uh, flights will get off the ground in May, but no specific date. Barry got in touch with us just before the six o'clock news. He was the one who had booked flights to Rarotonga in April as well as accommodation for April, right? He wanted to go in April. He says, after months waiting for a firm date, we'll now cancel. Come on, Jacinda and co. You're doing well with many other things, but delivery is glacial. Thanks for getting in touch, Barry. It is almost 18 minutes past six and you're with Checkpoint on RNZ National. European Union leaders have spent the day in virtual crisis talks trying to solve the slow COVID-19 vaccine rollout. Some want tougher restrictions on vaccine exports, saying too many vials are being sent overseas. The UK has so far vaccinated more than four times as many people as its European counterparts. The ABC's Samantha Hawley reports. With vaccine nationalism at play, getting 27 nations to agree on a way forward is no easy task. European countries are all scrambling for their vaccine share and the rollout has been lacklustre. The European Commission has blamed the pharmaceutical companies, mainly AstraZeneca, for not delivering promised doses. The President of the European Parliament, David Sassoli, addressed the press from Brussels. We can't even we allow ourselves to even waste a single dose of vaccine or to transfer vaccines to countries that don't need them. The French President, Emmanuel Macron, has admitted a lack of faith in the science has led to inoculation delays in Europe. Les experiments, Never in the history of mankind was a vaccine developed in less than a year, the president says. And so, on this, without a doubt, in a way, we didn't shoot for the stars. In the UK, the pace of the vaccine drive is expected to slow next month, but already more than half of all adults have received at least one dose. And Boris Johnson has warned the EU against disrupting the flow of supplies. Is that we're on the side of openness. Uh, that's where we are. If you, if you had to locate me, you, you asked for the libertarian. Uh, one thing I'm firmly libertarian about is free trade. As the virus takes hold again in Europe, the UK's lockdown will begin, albeit slowly, to lift next week. And in just over a fortnight, pints will begin flowing in pubs again, with outdoor areas permitted to open. And there's debate over whether vaccine passports could be used by pubs into the future. The British Prime Minister, Boris Johnson again. I, I, I think we need to think carefully about the issues. As I've said before, there are lots of difficult issues because there are some people who, uh, you know, who for medical reasons can't get a, a vaccination. Pregnant women can't get a vaccination uh, at, at the moment. You know, you've got to be careful about how you, you do this. Publicans like John Corbett aren't keen on the idea. We've had to jump through hoops. Uh, everything we've had to do to be COVID secure, more maybe than any other industry that I know of. And to suddenly plant this on top of us, I think is, a, is, is an injustice for us. It's been a very long time between drinks. Samantha Hawley reporting.
The UK's vaccination rollout is far ahead of the European Union's and nowhere is that disparity more evident than along the border of Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. Northern Ireland is part of the UK while the Republic belongs in the EU. CNN's Nick Robertson has this report. 101 years old. Mary Devlin gets her second vaccine shot. How do you feel now you've had your second shot? Oh, I feel wonderful. Her doctor, Dr Francis O'Hagan, is on a roll. I'm going to give you your vaccine. That's you all done. Putting shots in arms at a Northern Ireland clinic in Armagh just as fast as she can. All her over 60s done. It feels fantastic and at every clinic there's a real feel-good um, atmosphere. At a nearby sports centre, the same buzz. Dozens of health officials delivering 1,200 shots a day. So far across Northern Ireland, more than one-third of the population have had their first shot of vaccine. Rollout, according to the government, is going well. South of the border, in the Republic of Ireland, it's an entirely different story. Just across the Irish border in Monaghan, government vaccine supplies are stalling. Local doctor Ilona Duffy has no shots for the next few days. The real issue is that we're a large practice. We have over 1,500 patients over the age of 70. And to date, we've only been able to vaccinate about 210 of those patients. In Monaghan, people eye the other side of the border with vaccine envy. Unlike the UK, Ireland relied on the EU for vaccines and are way behind. It's a bit frustrating for people here, like, you know what I mean? These are all out of date. In his bar, Raymond Ochi is counting the cost of being shuttered through COVID restrictions for almost a year. A slow vaccine rollout in the south is adding to his woes. Business lost to Northern Ireland. They'll probably be open so much faster. And when they open, uh, the young people are just going to flock across to the border. On the border roads, Irish police run occasional COVID checkpoints, preventing non-essential journeys. They began when rocketing infections in the north spilled over, spiking outbreaks in Ireland. In the first month of full cross-border operation, police here have handed out more than 140 fines to drivers coming from Northern Ireland. However, there is no reciprocal system on the other side of the border. Both sides of the border. The uneven COVID response is worrying politicians. Pandemics don't recognise borders. We're a very small community, a small island in the northwestern periphery of Europe. We need to work together to deal with health issues. If we do get natural cross-border movements, we actually see uh, a higher degree of people who aren't vaccinated actually starting to come into Northern Ireland uh, and mix with, with our people here, and, and that's where we'd be concerned. Paradoxically, Northern Ireland's vaccine success offers hope south of the border. Now that the rates in the north are so low, so now that we know that that will probably continue because there will be less community transmission because so many people are vaccinated, I think we're going to find that our rates will reflect that. Both sides of the border hoping for a levelling up fast. And that report was from CNN's Nick Robertson. US President Joe Biden has held his first news conference at the White House since taking office in January. Mr Biden answered questions from reporters on several key issues, including COVID vaccinations, gun reform, immigration and foreign policy. He also confirmed plans to run for a second term in office with Kamala Harris as his running mate again. CNN's Caitlin Collins reports. Please, please stand. Thank you. Tonight, President Biden taking questions from the White House press corps in his first formal news conference. Facing multiple questions on his handling of the surge at the southern border, Biden said his administration is doing everything they can to process children faster. They're already getting better, but they're going to get real. They're going to get a whole hell of a lot better real quick or you're going to hear some people leaving. OK, we can get this done. The president blamed his predecessor for a lack of space for the record numbers of unaccompanied migrant children. What we're doing now is attempting to rebuild. He, in fact, shut down the, uh, the number of beds available. He did not fund HHS to get people to get the children out of those, those border patrol facilities where they should not be. 
after urging the Senate to move on House-passed gun bills this week that got major pushback from Republicans. Biden offered no timeline for when he will take executive steps. So we're, we're going to move on these one at a time, try to do as many simultaneous as we can. Instead, Biden making clear his top legislative priority is the infrastructure bill. All the things that relate to infrastructure, it's amazing. So there's so much we can do that's good stuff, makes people healthier, and creates good jobs. Biden opened the press conference by setting a new goal on coronavirus vaccinations. Now today I'm setting a second goal, and that is we will, by my 100th day in office, have administered 200 million shots in people's arms. That's right, 200 million shots in 100 days. With 2.5 million injections happening per day, the U.S. is on track to meet that goal by day 100 of his presidency. I know it's ambitious, twice our original goal, but no other country in the world has even come close, not even close to what we are doing. And I believe we can do it. At 78 years old, Biden is the oldest president to ever assume the office. And he said today he plans to run again in 2024. No, the answer is yes. My plan is to run for re-election. That's my expectation. But when it comes to who Biden will be running against, he answered with this notable question. I don't even think about it. I don't have, I have no idea. I have no idea whether it'll be a Republican Party. Do you? And that was Caitlin Collins reporting. Elephants in Africa are at increasing risk of extinction, far more threatened than previously thought. Both main species have seen a significant decline, the savanna elephant falling by 65% in 50 years, and the smaller forest elephant by 80%. The BBC's Victoria Gill has the details. The largest land animals on Earth. But their size has not protected them from the impacts of poaching or from the continued destruction of the vast swathes of interconnected habitat they need. This latest red list of threatened species, considered to be the comprehensive report on how nature is faring on an increasingly crowded planet, puts Africa's savanna elephants into the endangered category. Forest elephants are now even closer to extinction, critically endangered. It is an alarm bell for us. So there are two main reasons for these declines. One is the poaching of these animals for the ivory. And the second one is habitat loss through human activities that take place in total disregard of the needs of these animals. Across Africa, there are now just over 400,000 wild elephants. And this latest examination of decades of census data and habitat surveys has shown that the demand for ivory still drives a decline in their numbers. The level of threat they faced had also been masked by the fact that the African elephant was previously thought to be a single species. This is the first time the savanna and forest elephant has been assessed separately. What does it mean practically to have this information about their status? How do you use that to protect these animals and reverse these declines? Well, it, on the surface of it, it looks bleak. The fact that it's being flagged is actually positive because then it means we can do something about it. Um, and also separating the species, I think that's also positive because it means we can do something about it on a more concentrated level. The loss of species and natural spaces is happening all around the world. But conservationists are confident that this wake-up call could ensure that these giant icons of African wildlife get the protection and the space that they need. And that was Victoria Gill there. Now, we were talking in business news about uh, clothing company results and figures show that since COVID, men are not buying as many, well, formal clothes, you know, ties, suit coats, blazers, etc. I asked you what you're up to. Some of you got in touch. Uh, this person says, I always opt for op shop bargains, really buy new, except for shoes and underwear. That's good. And motorcycle gear. Uniforms are good for work, though, SC and Nelson says. Someone else says, I've stopped buying anything because both my gig jobs imploded, not where I expected expected to be at age 50. Bill's got in touch though. Bill's just bought a blazer. Mm, I wonder if it's a flash one. Back next week.
RNZ News headlines at 6.30. The former child, youth and family carer Earl William Opitaya has been found guilty of 21 charges of sexually violating and indecently assaulting young boys in his care. The Cook Islands Prime Minister Mark Brown says his country needs a